It's lived on in fame or infamy, depending which side you're on, for a hundred years now, for it happened 100 years ago this week, the Black Day of the German Army. I'm Indy Nidell. Welcome to The Great War. Last week was the fourth anniversary of the outbreak of the war, and it still raged as strong as ever. In the West, the initiative had swung back to the Allies, and they were slowly pushing the Germans back from the Marne salient. A coup in Baku installed a dictatorship, and the following day, that city managed to fend off the advancing Ottomans. Meanwhile, in Palestine, the British were making plans. In fact, Alan Donay's little plan, part of Edmund Allenby's master plan, began this week. Doney wanted to send the Imperial Camel Corps to attack Al Mudawara and also to destroy the railway viaduct to the south of Amman. This was also something of a ruse, since there were more than 150 kilometers between the two targets, and it would give the impression that there was more than one British force patrolling the area. The attack on Al Mudawara began in the wee hours of August 8th, with a diversion that drew troops away from the railway station there. The ICC then easily captured the station and one of the redoubts guarding the line. One of them was protected by artillery and machine guns though, but the Royal Air Force flew in and began bombing it and the defenders surrendered. The attackers then blew up the water tower and this was a big deal, for without that supply, a railway journey from Mon to Medina was basically impossible. Mudawara was halfway between Mon and Tabuk and this was the only source of water between them. The ICC then began the long ride towards Amman. Further north, other mounted units were heading away from another major city. On the 4th, Colonel Bisharikov suddenly withdrew his Cossacks from Baku and a thousand men from the garrison and went north to Derbent with no explanation. The same day, the first British turned up in Baku, 70 infantry and a few officers. This got that city to thinking that 20 to 30,000 British soldiers were soon to arrive. They weren't. The next day, the Ottomans launched their first real attack on Baku, trying to break through Wolf's Gate, which is a gap in the line of cliffs that separates the town from the railway. They were held back by artillery and rifle fire, and at noon, when the city's defenders counterattacked, the attackers were pushed back all the way to the railway, taking heavy casualties and losing 16 machine guns. The Ottomans decided to await reinforcements before a further attack. They were also worried about the rumors of a big British force supposedly soon to arrive. One place where there really were big British forces was the Western Front. Now, by early in the week, the Allies had occupied Soissons, and the Germans had now been pushed out of the Marne salient. Thing is, it had taken the Allies three times longer to clear it than it took the Germans to take it in the first place. And as David Stevenson writes in With Our Backs to the Wall about OHL, German High Command, and their planning this week, OHL authorized more offensives to be planned, believing no further big Allied attacks were likely and judged that it could stop them if they came. And then came August 8th. German Army Quartermaster General Erich Ludendorff would later call that day the Black Day of the German Army. This was the date of the beginning of the Battle of Amiens. Interestingly enough, a bunch of people have claimed credit for this battle. Stevenson says that Douglas Haig and Ferdinand Foch discussed it back in May, but that its immediate origins lay with Henry Rawlinson's British Fourth Army, which held that sector of the front. Both the Battle of Hamel last month and Australian raids in the region showed flawed German defenses, and Rawlinson was champing at the bit to take advantage of things while he could. He had made a proposal to Haig on July 17th to attack over the dry, solid ground with as many tanks as he could get, and five extra divisions, four of them Canadian. Haig had passed this on to Foch at their meeting July 24th, and Foch said, go for it, but put the French First Army on the British right flank. Now, Stevenson does not say that Rawlinson's proposals were from Australia Corps Commander John Monash, but other sources do. Anyhow, if you remember, Rawlinson had been in charge of a lot of the attack on the catastrophic first day of the Battle of the Somme two years ago. Back then, Haig had Rawlinson prepare for a huge breakthrough for the cavalry to exploit. And now, though this was a much more limited operation, Haig had Rawlinson set a target 20 miles further back than the main target, but only 
if there was success on day one. And also, and this is important, it was theoretical. He didn't change the actual battle plan, which would feature, for the first time, the Australians and the Canadians attacking side by side. They wanted to maximize surprise, but also equipment. So the artillery had way more shells than it needed, and Haig gave Rawlinson almost the entire British tank fleet, including the new Mark Vs. They had also identified 95% of the German heavy guns using things like aerial photography. The 4th Army had four Canadian, five Australian, five British divisions, and one American one. Arthur Curry's Canadians had not been involved in the defensive fighting over the past few months, and had instead been training for open battle. They, like the Australians, had a reputation for innovation and aggression. Well, the attack at 4.20 a.m. achieved surprise. Even in the first hour, thousands of Germans surrendered in the face of 2,000 heavy guns, field guns, and howitzers, 342 heavy tanks, 72 light tanks, and nearly 2,000 airplanes. They even had 120 supply tanks. The German first line was overrun before they could alert headquarters, with the Australians and Canadians leapfrogging each other. The leapfrogging was something that Monash and Rawlinson figured would allow deep penetration of the German lines beyond Allied artillery range, but with tanks and field guns moving up, guided by planes. The Australians advanced 15 kilometers by noon. What was new and shocking was the refusal of the German troops to respond to orders, even to attempt to stop and fight. The Germans lost more than 650 officers and 26,000 troops that day. Two-thirds of them surrendered. They did so willingly, eagerly, often in large and well-armed groups. Still, German General Georg von der Marwitz amazingly managed to bring them under control again. Not only did he stabilize the lines, he launched a counterattack that took back a few miles of territory. This was not the huge rout that is sometimes portrayed, even though it was the biggest Allied breakthrough on the Western Front of the war, which is pretty damn impressive. But remember, all those tanks sound impressive, but a heck of a lot of tanks broke down after just an hour or two in action. And they weren't all that tough to put out of action otherwise. I mean, they rolled over on uneven ground, they got stuck in mud or in shell holes, and of course, big guns could blow them to pieces. By the night, there were only 155 tanks in action. Also, Allied aircraft did not manage to destroy the Somme bridges to prevent reinforcements from arriving. So eight German divisions had arrived by the morning of the 9th. On August 9th, therefore, the Allies faced a rapidly strengthening antagonist. They had lost surprise, and most of their tanks were ahead of their artillery and telephone lines, had no pre-prepared attack plan, and did not begin until well into the day. Okay. They still made advances, sure, and the French captured Montdidier, but as the week ended, the momentum was slowing and slowing. Though Ludendorff required his men to hold positions that weren't really valuable and refused to listen to his command's advice to retreat to the Hindenburg Line and regroup, he just wouldn't give up all the territory the Germans had taken since March, even though a lot of it was not really defensible. And something else that really was not defensible was happening in the skies over Britain. On August 5th, Captain Robert Leckie, future chief of staff of the Royal Canadian Air Force, shot down a German Zeppelin, the 16th destroyed. It was a seven-engine model under the command of Peter Strasser, a Zeppelin legend who held the title leader of airships and had won the Pour Le Marie. Strasser and the rest of the 22-man crew were all killed. By now, the air defenses on the east coast of Britain were seriously well developed. They had searchlight stations, home defense squadrons, and warning control centers. So a Zeppelin raid by this time was pretty much a suicide mission. This would be the last Zeppelin brought down of the war. The Allies were active all over though. On the 3rd, the British land at Vladivostok. Two days later, so do the French. On the 6th, the Czechoslovak Legion takes Kazan. And I reached the end of another week. With British success in Palestine, home defense in Baku, and the Black Day of the German Army on the Western Front. It was pretty dark in OHL. The Kaiser told Ludendorff, we have reached the limits of our capacity. The war must be ended. And here's a quote from Ludendorff from August 9th at the end of the week. And a hundred years later, it's the end of this week too. We cannot win this war anymore but we must not lose it. 
If you'd like to learn more about the German defenses on the Western Front, the Hindenburg Line, you can click here for our special about that. Our Patreon supporter of the week is Ryan Turberville. Please consider supporting us on Patreon because that's what makes this show possible. Do not forget to subscribe. See you next time.